righty. Well, I'm going to be continuing uh, where Pastor Sam left off in Acts chapter 12. So, open your Bibles. And we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and start off by reading the whole ch- this whole chapter. Um, but we aren't actually going to be uh, studying the whole chapter. Um, we're actually only going to get to verse 5 and kind of 6, but just verse 5, really. Um, and so... Uh, I practiced this so on uh, Friday at youth group. Um, so I was just going to read to like the first the to verse five, but then uh, it's like this whole chapter is such a great story, and to leave it verse five, it would it wouldn't give it justice. So I got to read the whole thing at least, and then we're going to just study the first uh, five verses. So let's go ahead and uh, read. It says, About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Uh, He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread, and when he had uh, seized him, he put him in prison delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Uh, So if I just, we just stopped there, it's like, okay, that's a good, good section of scripture because it's the Bible, so it's good, but it gets, it just gets better. So I couldn't help myself. Uh, So now it's, Uh, Verse 6, Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the one side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that he was being, or what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened uh, from uh, it opened from them for sorry for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street. And immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, "Now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me." from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jew, Jewish people were expecting. When he had realized this, he went to the house of Mary and the mother, the mother of John, whose name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, uh, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hands to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when the day had come, there was no little dispute among the soldiers over what had been or what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judah to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Ty and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the 
king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when he had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose name was Mark. So, uh, that's quite an exciting story. We've got uh, executions, angelic prison breaks, and divine smiting, and then worm devouring. Um, But today, we're actually only, we'll only get to verse 5. Uh, So, if we go ahead, rewind, go back to verse 1, and refresh what it says. It said, about that time, Herod, the king, uh, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Um, so if we are in the ESV of version of the Bible this morning, so if it's, it might say something a little different, but uh, it's the, the same, ultimately it's about the same thing. It's saying the same things, just different words. Um, so now... Uh, there's a lot of Herods in the Bible. We have uh, different times throughout all of the, the New Testament where we hear about Herod. They're not all the same guy. So here comes your, your history lesson uh, for the morning. We're going to talk about uh, these Herods and kind of give clarification on who it is that we're talking about here, which Herod this is. So uh, first, the first Herod I want to tell you about is Herod the Great. Um, this Let's clarify something. He's great not because of uh, he's just such an outstanding guy, but rather he was great because he did uh, very outlandish and grand uh things. Like he's known before rebuilding the temple, and he's also no he was the the ruling Herod uh, during uh, the time when Jesus was uh, born. So he would have been the Herod that put out the decree that like all the toddlers and younger uh, boys would be put to death. Um, and uh, he had a lot of family. He had killed a lot of family. Um, he's killed his wives and his sons. There, uh, at the end of his life, one of his sons um, was uh, sentenced to death because it was like an attempt of poisoning uh, on Herod the Great. Two days later, Herod the great died so it seemed like like it was probably his son that had killed him so now he had two other sons uh one was philip and we don't really know much about philip but he was he ruled over part of uh the land and then the other son we is um antipas now antipas is important herod antipas uh, he is the the Herod. Uh, he was the son of Herod the Great, but he was the Herod that would have uh, uh, caused the decapitation of John the Baptist. Um, that was a whole weird story, like family of sort, where uh, he pretty much thought his, the, his like got tricked into being like seduced by his stepdaughter, and then. They like it's like I'll give you whatever you want, and so he goes to her. She goes to her mom. He's like, "Give me John the Baptist's head," and so he ends up having to give John the Baptist, uh, killing John the Baptist, um, and so that's Herod Antipas. Um, then this, then we come to another Herod, the Herod that we're going to talk about today, um, and that Herod is Herod Agrippa is the uh, the first. Um, they have this weird thing where, like, not now. Uh, he has a son, and he names him Agrippa as well. Um, but this is Herod Agrippa the first. Naming your son Herod wasn't enough now. He had to rename himself Herod Agrippa the second. I tried to, uh, with the youth group, I was like, oh, it's kind of like George Foreman. And he, like, had all the sons. And they're like, who's George Foreman? I was like, oh, no, I'm getting old. Uh, and then, it's like they even named his daughter Georgetta. I was like, <laughs> so they had to, they pulled it up on their phones and they figured out who he was. But 
like the barbecue guy, like the grill. And so it didn't go over as well at youth grill. Um, so, but Antipas, he's the one here that is, uh, he's a grandson of Herod the Great, not a son of Antipas. Um, but he, he's the one who here kills James and puts to death, uh, or sorry, and puts to death James and throws Peter in jail. Uh, his son, Agrippa II, or Agrippa Minor, he is a, you will we'll run into him in chapter 25 and 26 of Acts. Um, he'll be the, uh, oh, Paul will stand before him. He'll be sent by uh, Festus to stand before Herod, uh, Agrippa II. Um, now, the Herod... All of the Herods, they kind of had this complex of like trying to prove their Jewishness. They were kind of a half-breed. They were descendants of the Maccabees by their mother, but not by their father. Um, and so they kind of had this, this thing to try to please the Jewish people. That's like the Herod the Great, try, he built them the temple. Um, here we see that, that Antipas is trying to please the Jews in uh, this. It wasn't a political, or it was a political action, not a like, oh, justice or anything that looked like justice. It was just to find favor in the sight of the people. Um, so uh, they, so instead of being trying to be Jewish and like, oh, please the Lord, they'd be trying to be Jewish and be like be part of the club, kind of an idea. Um, and he was popular, popular with the Jews, uh, but he desired to, uh, to really um, rally the people. And he saw that how uh, just the, the small action, or not small action, the, just that, that when he had, um, without thought, killed James, that, oh, well, um, I saw the, the traction that that got. So he's like, okay, well, well, let's do this with Peter as well. Um, and it said that they, they lie, or he laid violent hands on the, the church. It's probably in reference to the church leadership. We have James and Peter. It's kind of the idea that, like, oh, if you, you cut off the head, the rest of the body is going to, to die. But it's instead of uh, dying, it was, well, the church acted more like a hydra would, where you cut off the head and two heads more, more will grow. And that's kind of how the church worked. And it's through persecution that the church grew. Um, and so instead of disappearing, it multiplied and it grew. Um, so then in verse 2, we have, it said, He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Um, this is, here we find the end of James' story here on earth and the beginning of his eternal life with God. We were talking this morning about, uh, and during prayer, about this death, about how uh, how it hurts and how it's like it seems like oh we never were meant to be like this and how like the balance between death being a blessing and a curse and how it, it is a, in fact a, a terrible thing because that's what the earth was cursed with was with with death and sin and that death really is the basics of that is separation from God and, or yeah, sorry separation from each other when someone dies you're no longer with them and that's what hurts because you're not with them and that's when when sin entered the world. Uh, there was a, that separation between man and God, and that was a death that had occurred. And now when we die as Christians, though we are now, a separation is happening between us and like the rest of the body of church, or there's a reconciliation between us and God. So there's the, the balance of like, oh, the joy in that, and then the sadness of the separation of, of the people here. Um, but this is, so we see this is uh, James's story. It's really just really short right there. So I want to give James a little bit more here and talk about his story and how, how he started and kind of going through now to his death. Though. So James's story started with Jesus calling him, excuse me, <laughs> and his brother. Uh, they were working or uh, fishing with their dad um, as their, their family business. And Jesus called them out and said, hey, follow me. They dropped their nets. They followed Jesus. Um, and immediately they followed him, and they continued to follow him. And they were very zealous in, in their following. They, were, they, they uh, coined the nickname of Sons of Thunder. Um, 
and James got to be with James and John got to be with Jesus on a, a lot of special occasions, um, from the raising of the daughter uh, of, of uh, Jarius from the dead, on the Mount of Trib, uh, Transfiguration, and he was one of the three who were brought closer to Jesus and the, at the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, James and John, uh, they also had a kind of one of those over the top moms, the overbearing moms. Um, that you know, when they, that one of the times where they had gotten together, they go to Jesus, or she goes to Jesus and requests that, oh, like, hey, when when you get to the kingdom, like my boys are in, right? They're gonna be like your right hand man's, right? And um, uh, when and then Jesus would and and talking to her, she's like, you don't really know what you're asking. It's like that's that costs a lot, and it's not even mine to give. It's it's the fathers to give out, and I could see her thinking that, like, oh well, you you took my boys from the family business, and now you, they hang out with you a lot, and they like tell me all these grand stories of what you're what you're doing, and let's kind of make this worth something, and let's like get the in on eternal in, in the eternal kingdom. Um, but what but she she didn't understand what she was asking, and said that that, that this does in fact have a cost, a cost. Um, to that, uh, that they both claimed that they were willing to pay, um, and that they were willing to go and pay the ultimate cost. And um, Jesus talks to them and tells them that, hey, like you, you're right. You are going to, in fact, uh, pay the the ultimate price. And they do, and they follow the example of Jesus and paying, uh, giving their lives for the faith. And we see here it was done by the hand of uh, Herod. Um, and in reference to the 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 type of death that he uh, that James uh, had was by the the sword, and that that was a um, the the execution style of of cutting off uh, any kind of um, false religion or any kind of uh, cult leader, basically, that would arise in them and trying to lead people astray. That's kind of how it would be assigned for them. I think it goes back to uh, the, the Levites and how like God had sent them to protect the holy things, and they armed them with swords. And that was kind of their thing, that they were to protect what is holy and um, to keep the, them unstained. And so the, their idea was that, that killing him by the sword was identifying him as a like a heretic, basically, um, so now we're in uh, uh, verse three, and it said, "When he had saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Uh, this was during the days of unleavened bread um So this action to go out and, and, and to arrest now Peter, um, he's the, the next guy that we're going to look at. Um, this was not like I had started off with. This wasn't a, some kind of uh, a form of justice or anything like that. They had, um, they had been there preaching the gospel for some time now, and uh, there wasn't a, a quick action of like, oh, well, this just started, and now we got to, like, Cut them, cut them out, and quiet them, and or anything like that. It was like, oh well, this this rash decision I made made them happy. So now I'm going to make a really big show out of this. And now uh, Peter, uh, we 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 see if we, as we look at him that uh, he's starting to really get a serious rap sheet. Um, this isn't the first time that he he's been behind bars, and uh, we know from uh, back in Acts chapter five, um, he was. Uh, he was arrested with the disciples, and um, if we remember, uh, or if you know the book of Acts, in chapter 5, the uh, angel also busted him out in, in during that time as well. Um, and so with this in mind, they, uh, they seem to kind of understand that, that that has happened, and so they'd like put all these different soldiers with him, and we'll get into that in just a, a little bit from here. Uh, so, but if we look at the, the current arrest, it says in verse four, when he had seized him, 
he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. Um, so this arrest, when it had happened, it occurred during uh, the, the seven days that followed the Passover feast, uh, the days of unleavened bread. It's kind of like uh, the idea of, of sort where like when Christmas time comes and you have like the Christmas break and so it's like a kind of a week long break or, or whatever with school. So you had like Passover and it took people would travel for Passover. Um, so it gives them like kind of that time off of work and kind of the idea of this whole festival is not just really one day. It is the like climax of it all one day, but there would have been this whole, it would be a whole holy week um, that was celebrated. And I, um, and in doing so, this kind of prolonged the trial because during that that week, you can't actually they wouldn't have any kind of if you were a good Jew and Herod was trying to show that he was a good Jew, he wouldn't have any kind of uh, trials or execution uh, during that time. Um, and you're like that. That's uh, like sorry, uh, which doesn't actually mirror any picture that we have of the normal trials that we think of because we think of Christ when he was put on trial during uh, for, before his crucifixion. And, um, and, and be, uh, that's because when they were, that whole ordeal of his trial and crucifixion was really just uh, under the table, underhanded, and they used uh, the system and abused the system and manipulated the Roman Empire to, be, to do the crucifixion for them. And if you remember, I talked about how uh, how Jesus had to, to um, have the spear thrusted into his side just to make sure that he was dead and the legs were broken of the other guys so that they could hurry up and get the bodies down and get rid of them, which wouldn't have been the normal practice during that time. They would have left the guys up on the cross as long as possible and let them suffer as long as possible. And it was done so to show a picture to anybody who was coming to Rome because outside the gate, and so it was done to show that it, to anybody that was coming into the city that Rome doesn't mess around. Don't try to lead a, an uprising in Rome. Don't try to, to best Rome because this is what's going to happen to you. Um, so this, uh, so with, with Jesus' trial, they, they did it under the cover of night and um, all hush-hush kind of a thing. But here... Uh, Herod's trying to show that he's, uh, you know, all on the up and up, observing all of the the Jewish, um, uh, or or um, all of the Jewish rules and laws. So he arrested him. He waited, and um, and uh, he would know, or Peter, sorry, Peter would know that his sentencing would soon follow the Passover celebration. Um, and it says that he was guarded by uh, four squadron or four uh, four squads of soldiers. A squad is a uh, it's actual number like set. It's kind of like if you say a century or a legion. A squad was uh, four soldiers. It was a squad of soldiers that led Jesus through the town to the cross. Uh, it was normally led by a centron, century, centurion, centurion. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> centurion. Um, so they would have led him there. And so now Peter has uh, basically 16 guards assigned to him. And it's like, oh, well, they must have heard about that one time where he was in jail and he escaped somehow. Um, they didn't want any funny business happening, so they actually chained him to two guards. What normal practice was just one guard. Um, and so what kind of makes sense uh, was that they kind of had would have had shifts during the night, four different shifts with four different guys, two guys chained to them, two guys outside the door. All 16, though, were responsible for this prisoner. Um, so we see here that how, how Herod wanted to make a spectacle of Peter, and it was the... Uh, um, and it seemed like, or it seems like, the, the, that Herod intended to execute Peter. Um, and, and we understand this uh, from the historical 
uh, things where the the guard, if a, if a guard was assigned to a criminal and that criminal like got free, whatever the the sentencing of that criminal was would be applied to those guards. So if like a guard or the crim uh, a person was incarcerated for stealing and like their hands, the sentence was that their hand was going to be cut off. Well, then the the guard that was guarding that person, if they escaped, their hand would be cut off. So we see here that uh, when Herod uh, he like um, looks at the guys and they're like, well, okay, I'm just kind of I guess just to make sure, like, are you guys all right in the head? There's 16 of you and just one of him, and so uh, the sentencing for them was death. And so that is to show that, that, that Herod fully intended to actually kill um, Peter. So we find ourselves in verse 5 now, where uh, Peter was, it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made uh, by God, sorry, was made to God by the church. Uh, so we we have uh, a couple examples being set here. Uh, we have Peter or, or we have Peter in prison and the church is praying. Like, well, Peter's in prison doesn't sound like a really good example. And like, oh, that doesn't sound like something I'm really interested in, which is true. I, that doesn't sound like fun. Um, but we can learn a lot from Peter in this. Um, in prison... Uh, if we go to the next verse, if we uh, see in, in verse 6 that it says that this is basically the eve of the night before sentencing, and we, we would find Peter awake, uh, all, up all night, stressing, worrying about what was going to happen next, because he knew what was going to happen, for, uh, that the sentencing would happen, right? That's what it says, right? No, no. no right? That's not what it says. Okay. Uh, we find him sleeping. He's just at peace sleeping and I don't think that it's uh, Peter I don't think it's that Peter is like me where I have no issue sleeping anywhere at any time uh, like it's kind of a problem um, I've fallen asleep on buses and missed my bus stop or like my growing up I would fall asleep like when my dad would take me out and go four wheeling I'd like end up falling asleep in the back seat or uh, the last time we were in Nepal uh, we did this super long car ride and I was jammed in the back of a I think it was like a forerunner basically but there was like literally it was just like the metal frame of the seat was kind of covered with like a blanket and like it was one of the roughest rides I've ever been on but I don't I definitely still fell asleep and everybody was like so mad at me it was like how can you sleep through this and um, so I don't think Peter had that problem I've also you know it, some people say that that's a blessing, like, oh, like, I can't sleep, and I stay up all night, and, like, I, I definitely don't say that's not a, like, I feel for you, because uh, that's, it's got to be hard, but sometimes, like, it's hard to, like, when I'm driving, like, that's not a good thing, and you got to pull over, or, or not pull over, and something bad will happen, and so it's like, it's a curse, too, um, trust me, so pray for me while I'm driving, um, yeah, pray for you guys too. No, uh, sorry, uh, but I don't think this was Peter's problem. Peter wasn't just like a like a narcolept or something like that. He he was resting in the Lord. He uh, it wasn't that. Oh, he just didn't know when it was coming. He knew the Passover. He he knew that the time was coming where he was gonna have his day in court. Uh, but he he also knew that his day in court had no chance of being a fair trial. I um, mean. Uh, Jesus, he didn't. He knew that Jesus didn't have a fair trial. He knew that James didn't even have a trial. It seems it just killed him. So he had. He knew that he knew that he had no hope of um, a fair judus, ju, judicial uh, sentencing. Um, but he had peace from God uh, that that if he. Uh, that God was in control and that if God wanted him to still be on the earth, then he would be. And if God decided that just like Peter, uh, or sorry, just like James, that it was his time to, to leave, then he knew that the following day, uh, the, that he, uh, through the, that whatever the court says, that he'd either be uh, 
doing the will of God or being with Jesus? Being following Jesus' word or being with Jesus? And that was okay with him. Um, and this peace came from spending time with Jesus. He like literally got to spend time with Jesus while he was on earth. And he literally got to be part of like the inner circle of, of Jesus. And then... Um, I, we, so that's something that we need. We can have that peace with God um, by drawing near to Him and, and being in the inner circle by actually spending time. It wasn't like an elective thing, like, well, He chose Him. It was like he cho- Peter, or, uh, Peter chose to be close to Jesus and draw near to Him. Um, and that's something that we, can, that we each can choose to do. Uh, I think also this peace came from the prayers of the church. Um, the the in Hebrews uh, chapter thirteen verse three it says remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body so it's like you were supposed to be having the mindset that like hey like we're chained along right right side with Peter just like that or the there's people all over the world last week our highlight was Voice of the Martyr who are who uh, addresses this and then the, who's like. That's like their verse. That's what they do, basically, is be uh, constantly remembering. That word remembering implies an, an active response to needs. Um, and here, back in verse Acts, or sorry, here, back in Acts, it uh, says that, uh, that their prayers were earnest prayers. Um, this word uh, it has uh, the, the root word and all the Greeks stuff about that it it's like a medical term or of sort or like a muscle like outstretching constantly like striving for something in front of it and um so like some some translations translate that word like constant prayer it's like it's both it's constant and it's earnest it's a passionate persistent prayer that's being uh that's being uh given up prayed to god in um the only other place where this exact word is used in the New Testament is in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 22, where Peter tells that, uh, it says that, to, that we ought to love one another with a pure heart, or a pure heart uh, fervently. So that word fervently there is the word here, like earnestly or constantly. It's a passion that's being displayed there. Um, and I would like to read a quote from Pastor uh, Chuck Smith where, about this section of Scripture. Um, it says, The arrest of Peter caused the church to wake up to the uh, present realities of, of the dangers they were facing. I often wonder what it will take to wake the church up today in the realities that we face in these days. We are living in desperate days, but the problem is that the church is not desperate in prayer before God. Uh, I see this as like our prayers are powerless because they lack the passion and the, the persistence. We, we pray oftentimes with the attitude that uh, we want God to care about something that we really don't care about at all Um, and in that our prayers become powerless and they they lack the passion and the persistence Um, and it's our our, our earnest prayers they have power and they have power not because we're convincing God of something it's not like oh like I really want this I really need to convince God that this is a good idea or this needs to happen or this needs to change um but Jesus tells us in a parable in Luke 18, um, this parable uh, it talks about uh, how not to lose heart when we pray. And well, I know that this is what this parable was about because in verse 1, that, that's what it tells us. That's what it's about. Um, it says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not to lose heart. So yeah, it's pretty easy. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, 
Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because of because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear uh, what hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will, or will he find faith on the earth? So we see we're being challenged there. It's that the, the judge is being contrasted with God. So don't get the idea that God is like, oh, it's just like bothered by your prayers and that you're nagging him. That's not, that's not what's being said. It's being contrasted with that where he, where he cares about what you're saying. So he, if the guy who like is just annoyed by you is going to do what like you're praying about or asking for, then isn't God in heaven who loves us and cares about us going to do it that much more quicker and that much more speedily? And then uh, there Jesus, like at the end, he's, there's that challenge, well, like is he going to even find somebody who has faith like this to pray and who's going to pray like this? Now we look at uh, earnest prayer does have power, not because it convinces God, but instead it shows that we care passionately about the things God cares about. And you may be thinking right now, well, I'm not really passionate about anything, or I'm not really, like, I, or I'm not passionate about much things. And I'll tell you, then you need to spend more time with Jesus. Um, and, and in John 15, it says that if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you wish and it will be done for you. And it's, the idea is that uh, if you are abiding in Christ, that, that abiding means to live in, like constantly, that is your abode, is where is Christ, and you abide, the same thing, in his word, then those desires or those things that you ask are going to start looking like things that God wants you to have. Um, because the word of God changes you. Your passions start to look a lot more like what God is passionate about, and then you have those passions and um, and then your prayers will start being more passionate like that, and we I think that 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 those those that comes from as we read the Word of God we get a, a greater understanding of who God is, and um, when we remember we'll know who the God is that we're praying to and that He cares for us and that He is the Creator, and that He is our good good Father that that uh, knows how to give us good gifts. Now we look at this and we see that that maybe uh, that the world may be prospering. That Herod has the upper hand. I mean, he had he had the, the, his soldiers, he had his prison, but the church has the power of prayer, and that's something that we needed to stand fast in. Um, so let's do that. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this morning, for this opportunity to get into your Word, Lord, and I pray for everyone here that they that. Uh, you put a passion in their heart. We pray for, I know that at times, Lord, that I, I lack passion. And, and it's those times I realize where I'm, I'm drifting from you, and Lord. And I pray that, that uh, you help us draw near and that you give us that passion and to, to get into your word and to, to follow steadfastly after you, Lord. And uh, as we look at the world and the, the wickedness that, uh, is around us that it seems so big and um, and so powerful, Lord. But you, Lord, are sh- you are more powerful. You are our good Father who takes care of us, and uh, you are good. You are great, Lord. And we pray this in your Son's name. Amen.